The pages you could hear being turned are from the book you can now see on screen. It's almost 40 centimetres tall and it's bound in its original board and calfskin cover. It was printed in the early 1540s in Switzerland and it's one of 11 folio volumes of St Augustine's writings. These 11 volumes became the very first books accessioned into Cheatham's Library in 1655. In book six of St Augustine's Confessions, he tells a short but shocking story about visiting a bishop called Ambrose in Milan. What shocks Augustine is that he finds Ambrose sitting in his cell and reading silently. Now that might sound incredibly prosaic to us, even boring, but in the 4th century AD, when Augustine was travelling, culture was primarily oral, and even scriptural practices were aimed at recording things so that they could be respoken. There's plenty of good evidence that people read silently in the ancient world, but Augustine's diary of disbelief at witnessing a body reading silently is one of the first detailed accounts of the practice in Western literature. And the 16th century copy of Augustine's story held at Cheatham's comes from that moment in European culture that began the shift away from a primarily oral culture to a primarily textual one. That shift from communities of recital, through the culture of manuscripts and into the age of printing with movable type. Cheatham's library comes from that same moment of change too. The building that became the library was constructed in the 1420s by Manchester Parish Church. This product of the late Middle Ages still has cells on the ground floor and the high beamed spaces of study and worship upstairs. Some years ago, I got excited about this overlapping set of three historical coincidences. First, that Cheatham's had been host to changing reading habits since the Middle Ages. Second, that Cheatham's first acquisition contains Augustine's story. And third, that modern reading habits and literacy models mean that public libraries, like Cheatham's, are public spaces where we go to have primarily private experience. Now, I became convinced that these overlapping coincidences held some kind of a story about the history of silent reading. But I couldn't figure out a way of telling that story. I'm a writer who makes artworks, and I couldn't find an effective way of saying it or showing it. For the rest of this talk, I'm going to show you some very rough cuts of video that were shot at Cheatham's in April this year, during that weird liminal time between lockdown and the slow reopening of cultural spaces. During the lockdown, I started to have a recurring dream about those libraries all around the world that were closed because of the pandemic. Now I've got no idea what that dream means symbolically, but it did help me to untie the knot in this project. I realised that this project isn't about telling the history of silent reading, but instead about exploring the many silences that libraries are organised around. That extraordinary muteness of the holdings, the organisational structures, the architectures, and so many of the human behaviours they're all designed to enable. All of this mutedness, these so-called silences, are really non-silences. They're noisy and bodily and inscriptive and built. They're a chorus of non-silences, the non-silences of profound attention. Just as Augustine was shocked when he visited Ambrose in Milan, when we visited Cheatham's in April, the form of profound attention we witnessed took us by surprise. It was all about care. The care of deep cleaning shelves that have collected dust for centuries. The care of updating condition reports for holdings that have housed bookworms and book chains. Care for the micro and macro ecology of the library's very existence. What we're trying to do with the footage is find a way to show and talk about this chorus of non-silences, of care for the library's ecology, of the privacy of public reading, of the sheer persistence of the library as a public space, a community and an organisational logic. To slowly start to find a way of holding all that together, 
we're keeping the footage intentionally silent. We're also keeping its colouring as close as possible to the stark contrast we found as the library blinds were being lifted, the library was being slowly reawakened and the springtime sunshine started to flood back in through the Gothic windows. What you started to see overlaid on that dark footage are a series of brief sentences. They appear like subtitles, but they're not anchored to any speaking voice. Each sentence makes a self-sufficient proposition. It says something about this chorus of non-silences. But we're starting to sequence these sentences into little sets of four or five propositions. They're not really paragraphs. They're more like suites or even stanzas. They don't caption the footage you're seeing. Instead, they add a different non-silence to the chorus. I can't really tell you anything more about this project. When I'm making art, I never know what I'm really doing and I'm in the midst of exploring the material we captured at the moment. I'd just like to thank Fergus Wilde at Cheatham's for giving us access at such a strange time and to thank the two librarians you keep seeing, Laura and Claire, for letting us watch them work. I'd also like to thank cameraman Dominic Joyce and audio recordist Aidan Razzo for coming with me and to thank Craig Dworkin, who's co-writing the sentences. Thank you, too, for watching, and I hope you enjoy the festival. <laughs>